We're back and we welcome Leslie Abramson, the attorney for Eric Menendez. She's regarded in Los Angeles and around the country as one of the best defense attorneys in the business. It's nice to have you with us. Nice Leslie, any thoughts here. on Mr. Grant and that whole hullabaloo? You know, it's funny. I was in New York City a couple of years ago and I first heard about this guy. There was a piece in New York Magazine. And what struck me was, I think it was him who had, was talking about lining welfare mothers up against the wall. You know, and I was thinking, I grew up in New York City. This was the city, the, me the original melting pot, the city of tolerance, you know, pre-Mayor Koch. It, it really hurt that there's a guy who's such a hate monger on the air in New York. And he clearly is a hate monger. You think it's just not just poor attempts at humor? No, it's, it, well, you know, humor can be very vicious. Humor is a way to, to conceal real evil intent. No, I think he's a hateful guy. You're writing a book, Leslie? I'm writing a book. The biography of Leslie? The autobiography of my career, basically. My private life, I try to keep private. Simon, you got to do an autobiography, you got to discuss your private life. Well, it just sort of weaves its way in and out, but, you know, we keep all the secrets. That's the way. You write the one with the secrets when you're 70 and nobody yeah. cares anymore. This will be for Simon & Schuster? Simon & Schuster, yeah. You got to deal with trials? And... Yeah, I deal with cases and how they're handled. It sort of takes people into the inner workings of how a defense lawyer operates. It's less preachy than, you know, walk with me in my shoes. What's the latest with Leslie and, and all that happened at the end of the trial that no. you had influenced or asked the psychiatrist? Tell us what that story was. It's a, it's a long, complicated well, story. What break it, it down. To, all right. It's a two-part story. Three years ago when we were preparing for this witness to take the stand at the very, very end. This is a doctor, end, right? It's a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. The very end of Menendez one. This was a very minor witness. He wasn't my chief psychiatrist. He's Eric's therapist. Guy who worked with the kid when the kid was really screwed up. So we're preparing him to testify. The judges made a whole series of rulings in the case. I sit down with him and I say, this isn't going to be admissible. This isn't going to be admissible. This isn't going to be admissible. The judge has ruled. So line it out before we turn over these notes to the prosecution. There were a couple of other things in his notes that I said, I don't understand what this means. Clarify. This is the conversation I'm having with him. As it turns out, which I don't find out for almost three years, he took stuff out instead of just blanking it out. That, that's Blanking what the whole... it out ordinary, does that happen? Blanking it out happens all the time. All right. Happens he takes all the it time. completely out. He and takes it, not only does he take it completely out, he rewrites the pages and doesn't tell me he's And says done you that. asked him to do this? No, he didn't say I asked him to rewrite. He says I told him to take out. So that's the status of what happens three years ago. And what's the status now? I turn the original notes over now to the prosecution for this trial. They have the absolute original version. So in this trial. Yes, yeah. that's my, and he's a good friend of mine, going back for years and years. Someone I like, someone who I think is very honest. We just have a real difference in uh, recalling is, is what all happened. Are association trying to take some action? Are you in any kind of legal trouble? No. None Not at all? any kind of legal trouble. I'm in PR trouble. Because? Which is, well, because, because. because is an investigation going on? What, what, where does it go There is no investigation here? going on at this time that I'm aware of. The Bar Association has said they wouldn't do anything, if at all, until the case is over. And this thing boils down to the same kind of thing people saw a lot in the Simpson case, you know, when the lawyers wouldn't turn the document over and they got hit with $900 fines. It's the same kind of thing, but I have not been fined by the judge. He hasn't done anything. Have you spoken to your client since the verdict? I spoke to my client today, in fact. I had a very interesting talk with my client. Today. About? I'll tell you a little bit about it. Okay, he authorized me to tell you. Okay. I have been, this is uh, Eric. This is Eric. I've been trying to figure out where he's going to wind up spending the rest of his life. and. The prisons are very, very brutal places, very scary places. So I'm getting increasingly depressed thinking about this person who is a person with sensitivity, with feeling, with compassion for other people, uh, not a tough guy being in these prisons. So I, I told him today on the phone, I, hadn't gone, I haven't gone to see him in a while. I said, Eric, you know, I'm getting really depressed about where you're going to wind up. He says, oh, come see me. I'll cheer you up. I said, but I'm very scared about what's going to happen. He says, don't worry about me. I don't want you to worry about me. I'll be okay. Now, I, I, this is just either dementia on his part, or he, I mean, I know that he cares a great deal about how I feel about things. Doesn't Does he want appear me to have worry. totally accepted this now? Yeah, he has. I mean, it's just the way he accepted being in jail. What, what always convinced me, Larry, that he really had a horrible childhood was how easily he accommodated to the horrible life in jail. In fact, in the first, I'd say, year and a half, he thought jail was a freer environment than anything he had known before in his life. When the, trial, when the verdict came in and they recommended uh, life, we had on relatives of the mother. I saw the show. And uh, they said they never saw an indication I know. of that mother you know, doing anything. Let me, let me tell you Were something. Were they lying? 
I'll tell you something about about brother. the her brothers. I know. Um, I talked to Eric about that show and what his uncles said on that show. And I could sit here and refute line by line what they said. You know what Eric said to me? Don't say anything bad about my uncles. Don't say anything bad about my mother. Don't say anything bad about the family. Let them heal. Really? Really. How's he always he always loved his Uncle Brian, looked up to his Uncle Brian. Brian said thought, he loved him. Thought his Uncle Brian was his friend. Things changed at a certain point in the case. I can't even tell you what my opinion is. He told me, don't say anything bad about them. Let everybody rest in peace. And that's what I'm going to do. How's Lyle doing? I don't know. I haven't talked to him in a while. I think okay. I mean, there... You didn't represent him, but you obviously... I didn't represent him, but I know him very well. Sure. You know, and I've seen him grow and change and become a, a more sensitive person and a more uh, emotional person than he started where out. Should, where would you send them? If you were the, does the judge have the, who does Where would thing? I send them? Yeah, no, I mean, let's say you have no, you have, they have to go somewhere. They're sentenced to life. All right, they Where have to go to prison them? somewhere. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I don't have enough expertise about these prisons. Um, I'd send who them decides? to a minimum, the Department of Corrections, I'd send them to a minimum security prison because they're no threat to anybody, but that won't happen. Not, there, and is, is there a state minimum security prison? Oh, there are many, many. But the problem is the way the system works is depending on the length of your sentence and what you're convicted of, you start out as a maximum, maximum security prison prisoner, which is a, what's called a level four. So they have to go to a, a, either a level four prison or if there's some special needs. I mean, Eric does have psychiatric needs, medication needs. He might get into a level three prison, but San Quentin level this four. is not camp. This is uh, not is fun. San Quentin level four? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Are he and Lyle going to remain together? I hope so. I they hope should so. remain together? They should remain together, yeah. Yeah. Because? Well, because it's protection for each other, and that's the main concern that we have is for them to be protected. Does a lawyer have much of a say of how clients are treated in prison? None. Zip -up. Unless something really bad happens, you can sue. But none. The Department of Corrections is totally autonomous. The judge wouldn't have any say, even if he wanted to exercise it. Really, they're a, they're a world unto themselves. We'll be right back with Leslie Abramson on Larry King Live. Don't go away. We're back with Leslie Abramson on Larry King Live. Whew. Life is not easy in your world of defending interesting people. Right? It hasn't yeah. been easy in the last few years, I'll tell you. It's been stress central. I have manifested symptoms of stress I never knew existed before during this last trial. Are you working on cases right now, though? No, I'm not working on any cases right now. I am Why working not? on my... Because I have called a moratorium for a few months. I want to remember who I was before I became the Menendez lawyer. I did have a life before. Are you angry with the judge for not letting in? I'm not angry with him, no. I've been beaten down into submission. I think he was wrong, and I think that based on his... not letting in certain things. Oh, not letting in certain things, limiting other things, deciding on one jury, deciding on where the jury pool should come from, taking away our defense at the end. I mean, I was not happy with any of these things, but... After a while, I mean, I've been losing in that court for two and a half years. After a while, you know, you can't get angry anymore. What is it like emotionally during that part of the trial when you're arguing to spare a life? Well, Nothing you know, to do with guilt or innocence, but life. Or it death. is overwhelming. You know, you say to yourself, they didn't teach us this in law school. It's like going in to do brain surgery with no training. I mean, there is no way to describe how that responsibility of somebody else's life is so bizarre. I mean, you're just a lawyer. You're just a lawyer, you know, you're just an ordinary slob lawyer. And you've got to get up there in front of 12 strangers and say, don't kill this person. It's extremely bizarre. It's a terribly taxing job. It might also be tough on the prosecution too, isn't it? Not kill this person? Well, it depends on whether you're a prosecutor with a soul or not. It's tough on the ones with souls. Some of them have refused to do it. There's a judge in Los Angeles, a very fine man named Richard Nydorf, who was a DA who did one death penalty argument and told his office he'd never do another. That's a mensch. You're obviously opposed to the death penalty. I'm very opposed Did you have to any fears penalty. that they would get it? Oh, yeah. You bet I did, because first of all, we were stunned by the first degree murder verdicts. We thought that was very extreme, what did given you think the evidence. Get? We thought we'd get seconds, actually. I mean, we didn't think we could do well because of the way the rulings had shaped the trial, but we thought that what we were really looking at was seconds, so we were stunned with the first. So therefore you thought a good possibility of... Oh, yeah. Oh, for right, sure. Now, the sentencing is in July. Right. 
What are we waiting for? He know, we know what he's going to give them, right? Yeah, but we have to make a record for, on a, with a motion for a new trial. There's about 20 different rulings, significant rulings the judge made that we want to list as error. And we have to bring that all back to the judge, give him a chance to fix it, and then they'll be sentenced. What did it bring to you with a lot of the community laughing since here were two guys who obviously did what they were trying? I mean, they did this murder, they went back out to the car, they got another gun, it was brutal, and they, and they lived high. Okay. I mean, how much of it came on to you? that you are defending. Oh, well, I mean, you know, you, you know as a defense lawyer that you're not going to win any p popularity contests. I usually put that into a shorthand saying, I'm not Shirley Temple, everybody isn't going to love me. And it goes with the turf of being a defense attorney. In this case, though, I think I saw all the evils that I knew would attend a trial when it got high exposure, high publicity, and this kind of cruelty that runs through one particular aspect of the media, like Mr. Grant. You know, the hate jocks of talk radio. That was actually the worst element of the publicity about the Menendez brothers. One of the local stations had a contest called Fry the Menendez. I mean, these are human beings. These are young kids at and the time. Of this oh, yeah, yeah. And an auction. Cruel, mean-spiritedness. Uh, you know what I don't quite understand? And maybe you know, Larry, because you talk to people all the time. Where is all the anger and the hatred that's directed towards criminal defendants, people in public life. Where is it coming from? What is making all these people in this country so unhappy that they get this worked up about things that are outside their own life experience? Lenny Bush's it. theory is there's no communism to hate anymore. Maybe that's it. So Lenny Bush is dead. Him. How do you know that's his theory? He told me 30 years ago. There was still communism then. Yeah, he said the big problem is going to occur when communism falls. Maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe he the country... He hate radio. Maybe the country doesn't have a political enemy, so we're turning on each other. It, it's really ugly. What did you make? Did the, did the Simpson verdict have an effect on your trial, do you think? I don't know, but I cried when it came in, I'll tell you. you. cried when it came in? I cried. I was in the Van Nuys courthouse. I thought all defense in. attorneys wanted a not guilty. No, I said this is bad for the boys and everybody else. It's Why? going to be payback time. Because the, because the people, the real people of the country got the wrong view of the criminal justice system. They thought guilty people were walking out all the time, and in fact, innocent people are being convicted. And sort of semi-guilty people are being over-convicted, which is what I think happened to the Menendez So brothers. Simpson was the exception. Absolutely the extreme, bizarre, distorted, out there, never happened before, never happened again exception. But people, it made people angry at the system, and they were going to take it out on other people, not consciously. Do you believe Mind in you. Robert, Shiro's, Robert Shapiro's book that contends that whether you thought he was guilty or innocent, they didn't prove him guilty? Well, I don't know. It depends on each individual's juror, juror levels. You know, I as a juror might have felt differently than the ones who sat there, but I as a criminal defense lawyer should never be a juror. I'm one of the most cynical sure. people on earth. Back with your questions for Leslie Abramson after this. Don't go away. We're back with Leslie Abramson. Let's go to some phone calls. Milford, Connecticut. Hello. Hi, Larry. Hi. Miss Abramson, yes. did the lack of cameras in the courtroom for the second trial impact your case in a negative or positive way, and how? Well, psychologically, on, on the lawyers, it impacted it in a positive way because we were under less pressure uh, knowing there wasn't some smart pants like us out there critiquing every move we made. I, I don't know if it had any effect whatsoever on the judge and his rulings or any effect on the jurors since I, obviously the judge would never tell me and I haven't talked to the jurors about it. But generally speaking, I prefer to trial without cameras. Without? Without. Well, I always was opposed to it and I've been proven right. But don't we have a right to our courtroom? You have a right to go and sit, Larry. They'd let you in. You could sit there like anybody else. The camera distorts. And the commentary distorts even more. And you know, I'm guilty of that myself. You I commented. I was a commentator on Simpson. I tried to be a very restrained one. But I remember a few smart remarks I made during the course of it that I probably shouldn't have made. It's too tempting to give your own opinion, to form your own conclusions. Why does that trial linger with us so much? Why do we keep Simpson? talking about it? Yeah. Because it was something we all shared. I mean, I have a theory about it. The good side of it, it gave everybody of every race, color, and creed something to talk about at the bus stop. On the, at the lunch counter, everywhere. It's something we all shared together. Worcester, Massachusetts, for Leslie Abramson. Hello. Yes, I'd like to know what um, her comments would be about Marsha Clark's style and how um, maybe some similarities. 
I don't know that Marcia and I are very similar, but I've always liked her very much. I think she's a very good lawyer. I mean, that, that's really all I can say. Like her as a prosecutor? I like too. her as a person. I liked her as a prosecutor. I thought in court she had a very good style. I don't know who is behind the tactics and strategy of the case, which everyone has criticized endlessly, so you don't need my two cents on it. But I've always had a very, a very positive What's feeling about Marcia. What's your overview of Judge Ito? I've always liked Judge Ito a lot. Tried cases before? Yes. In fact, I went to see him a few, uh, a few weeks ago to commiserate with Ain't It Awful to Be Notorious. It is. He, he dislikes it? He dislikes you dislike it. it? I dislike it. I hate it. I would, but the plus side is you get clients? You don't get clients. You don't get clients. They all think you're too expensive or you're too busy or if they hire you, someone will think you shotgunned your parents to death. They associate you with your case. You don't get clients. No one understands this. Notoriety doesn't help you be a criminal lawyer. It helps get you on television if you want to be on television. We'll be back with our remaining moments with Leslie Abramson. By the way, tomorrow night... We'll have Robert Stack here and a whole program devoted to unsolved mysteries. Should be fascinating. We'll be right back with Leslie. Don't go away. We're back and we go to Bend, Oregon. Hello. Hello. Mr. King, I love your show. You're great. Thank you. My question for Mr. Ms. Abramson. Ms. Abramson? Yes. Uh, but my question is, what's life, life going to be like for you after this is all over and what Will it get back to normal for you? Uh, I don't remember what normal is. Normal was six years ago. I don't know what life's going to be like. I'm sort of uh, keeping my options open. I have a lot of choices. Is there a chance you might leave law? There's a chance I might leave law. There's really? a chance I might go to work for a law firm, which would be a, a new Big experience. law firm? Corporate? Big law firm? Big law firm. Corporate Mucker, business. Mucker, Meyer, Goyland, Goyland. Schmidt, yes, Schmendrick, Hendrick, and Hendrick, and Fu. Yes, and Abramson. Um, there's a chance I'll be doing television. There's, ah, what kind? Ah, I don't know yet. I don't know yet. I'm, I'm trying to do something newsy, opinionated, but not hate, not angry, if this can be done. Have you thought of a format? We've thought of formats. Talk I, to networks, talk to people? Talk to people, talk to syndicators. We're talking to networks. So there's a chance to do that. There's a chance I won't do nothing for a while. I your might husband, actually stay home and raise the baby. Your husband is in journalism, kid would, right? A kid would fall over at a shock if mommy was home during the your day. Your husband is in journalism. My husband works the Los Angeles Times. Did that affect his reportage, married to you? No, no, no. He's actually an excellent court reporter. He was on The Simpson Beat. We had something Give really... Give a plug. Fun. His name is what? His name is Tim Rutten, and uh, he won a Times editorial award. He with Henry Weinstein for their coverage on yeah. The Simpson Beat. And by the way, we're going to do a show on this upcoming, but Leslie... Adopted a baby. We're going to yes. do a show on adoption. We should do a show of that the kind of adoption on. I did, yeah. There's nothing like it, right? There is nothing like it. Yeah, I was trying to tell you, you should do this. That's right. And you, you, you adopted while working on the Menendez, right? I adopted while working. It took two days off in the middle of Menendez 1 to be at the hospital with my birth mother, catch the baby as he came out. It's a, a remarkable experience. It, open adoption is a fascinating experience. And, and something, you don't walk around thinking of him as adopted. Do you? No, and you know what? There's a campaign by adoptive parents, and I would really like to see us win this campaign. Which to is? To stop having the media identify people's children as adopted children. Do they do that? Constantly. Any celebrity. I was watching a, a, you know, George Burns' biography on A&E. His adopted children. There is children. They make yeah, second-class yeah. citizens. I didn't even know they were adopted. It's all over the place. Every time you, you watch, you start being sensitive to that issue. You'll see it in print. You'll hear it on television, on the radio. I never it's, thought. Yeah, it discriminates against these children. Thanks, Leslie, as always. Oh, nice to see and you'll you. You'll be back on our adoption show. Yes. And back a lot in a few, and when the book comes out. Ah, uh, yes. Our guest has been Leslie Abramson, the attorney for Eric Menendez. Tomorrow night, uh, Robert Stack and Unsolved Mysteries. Friday night, Sharon Stone. And Saturday night, a tribute to the legendary... Mickey Rooney. From, and one week from tonight, Peter Jennings. Good night.